going to tell you a story. I'm 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 going to tell you a story. Aurora Wasteland Quarantine by Vaughn Ashby. Episode 4 There's Something Buried Under Grandma's House. Intro from the narrator. The longer the virus was part of our lives, the more people started to look for alternate forms of information on it. We all have family members who fell for the social media false information. It's likely they were older. At some point, when you first started surfing the web, they told you not to believe everything you read on the internet. Oh, the irony. Wait, is that irony? I'm going to need Alanis to fact check me. Anyway, the data shows that older family members were spreading all kinds of misinformation around the web. It's likely their brains were just trying everything possible to understand what was happening to them and the world around them. The virus was taxing. Some people broke. Working together would have been the best way out of this, but that wasn't the case. As always, large scale events like this are the perfect time for shithead wannabe evil people to try and take control. Their weapons of choice this time around was gaslighting, whataboutisms, and misinformation. Their lies convinced people that the virus wasn't real. Their lies killed people. Even now, after so much of the incorrect information has been proven wrong, it's still passed around. For some reason, people stopped believing experts. People that had spent their lives dedicated to studying a field and instead opted to believe what they read on some old fart particles website. It's ironic that in the days that we finally understood the virus, people were choosing to believe ideas that looking back now seemed as sane as believing in lizard people or grand government conspiracies which, well, we'll circle back to eventually. Don't worry. The world was starting to feel normal. Well, as normal as it can for a pandemic. Then, as if by design, the abnormals started to leak out of people. The strange thing was, at the time, the misinformation, the gaslighting, the whataboutisms, made all the weird and strange of the auroral wasteland seem as if it wasn't there at all. Real life took over the strange and weird, which was, for lack of a better term, weird. Welcome to the Aurora Wasteland Quarantine. Police report. Strange light sighted above rural community. Alberta, strange sighting, RCMP. RCMP are looking for anyone with images or video taken of the night skies around the Drayton Valley, Alberta area. Parts of strange lights moving around the sky need verification. RCMP are hoping that members of the community with video surveillance systems or YouTube channels of late night cow tipping or erotica could provide video. Okay, I may have added the last part, but I mean, come on, who doesn't love a good late night cow erotica video? Don't lie to yourself. You know you're interested. The story. The clouds looked more and more like sheep as they lazily made their way across Tom's window. They'd been driving for almost an hour. He'd hit the end of his CD a few minutes ago. At times like this, he wished he wasn't such a music snob. If he could have, he'd have brought his record player to listen to music while they drove. But that wasn't feasible, his dad had said. So Tom had dug out his mom's old CD player and found a couple of her CDs he had vinyl copies of. He'd started one called Morning Sky Monster by Rainbow Fart Cats because he liked the art on the cover. A giant mountain with a monster reaching down from the sky. He loved the classic metal album covers that looked like they should be art hanging on your wall. Tom reached down and grabbed another CD from his backpack he had at his feet. He wished the drive would stretch out longer. It had been so long since he'd been out to the house. The drive was nice. The clouds were relaxing. The music was, well, actually, it was pretty good. He opened the CD player and swapped out the CDs. The music of burning Cheerios flooded his ears. Tom leaned back to get comfortable. They'd be there soon. He knew the drive well. The further they got from the city, the more things got, for lack of a better term, hickish. It was a gradual process. At first, the houses are nice and the yards are well kept. Then you start to see property with rusty vehicles that haven't moved since before Tom was born. Eventually there are hand-painted signs claiming the government is being run by lizard people, and farms so littered with junk you'd have a hard time finding the house. They were in that part of their journey. As much as Tom loved living in the city, there was something about being out here that he'd always liked. He didn't mind the hickishness, well, except for the lizard people signs. No, he liked repairing things and learning how mechanical things worked. There was a lot out here to fix, which was the point of their little drive today. Tom's dad's mother, his grandma, lived out here. She had moved from the city for some reason. None of them could ever figure out why she moved out to the middle of nowhere. Unfortunately for her, 
getting a repairman out there was challenging, to say the least. So, Stu, Tom's dad, and Tom's older brother Henry were on their way out to fix. Normally, Henry didn't tag along, but it had been weeks since they'd left the house. Also, Stu had been temporarily furlonged at work, and wanted to get as much time in with his boys as possible while he was at home. As they rounded the corner, Tom could see his grandmother's house amongst the trees. There he saw the multitude of rusted out vehicles that littered the property. The tall grass that covered most of it, and the brand new sign blaming the government for putting microchips in the drinking water. At which point he questioned his father if it was possible that he was adopted. Stu only laughed at the question. At which point Henry asked why their grandmother had moved out there. She'd been so happy in the city. Again Stu laughed. He told them that his mom had always been a little paranoid. As they drove down the gravel driveway and parked in front of the house, Lena, Stu's mother, and Tom and Henry's grandmother came running out of the house, her bathrobe wrapped tight around her, her hair up in a bun. Almost as if on cue, somehow related to seeing Lena, Tom's teeth started to hurt. It felt like the feelings in his mouth were being pulled all at the same time. It lasted only a few seconds, but it was enough to fill Tom's eyes with tears. Tom looked over to see Henry's eyes were watery too. The two of them looked at each other and shrugged. Things were always a little strange out here at Grandma's place. They didn't really question it. Stu handed both boys a fabric mask and told them to put it on. Tom hadn't really had to wear one very much since the virus hit. He'd been home for most of it. Stu said he had been quarantining himself with music and girls. Tom had laughed at the joke, but his dad hadn't been wrong. He'd spent his day calling and video chatting at school, listening to music on vinyl of course and chatting with the girls in his class that missed him. Turned out there was a lot of them, and Tom enjoyed chatting with each of them, though to be fair, it had eaten up a lot of his day now. Coming out here was actually a nice break. As the three boys stepped out of the car, Lena let slip a chuckle. She told them that they looked like sheep, and that they didn't need to have their liberal masks on out there, that the fictional virus wasn't out here. Stu told her that the masks were just as much for her as it was for them, and that they'd be keeping them on. Lena made a ba sound then motioned for them to follow her. She had cookies all ready for them. The inside of the house smelled and felt exactly as Tom remembered it, a mixture of dust and old lady. It was hard to put a finger on what exactly the old lady smell was, but it was present. Lena had always been emboldened with extra strength old lady smell. She offered the boys cookies, which they took and removed their masks to eat. She told them that they looked much more handsome that way. Stu interrupted the awkwardness by asking where his dad was. Lena replied by informing them that he went to town, whatever that meant. After another awkward pause, Stu asked if Tom was ready to fix the water system. Lena protested and asked if both boys could stay with her. Stu said he really needed their help, but Henry volunteered to stay behind. He mouthed to Tom that he owed him. As Tom was clearing the cookies from the table, at Lena's request, he noticed a sticky note next to the phone. It looked like a phone number, except it was only six numbers. Tom laughed, then heard Stu call for him and rushed to catch up. The house door slammed behind Tom as he joined Stu outside the house. The two walked across the tall grass towards a small wooden building that stood in the middle of the yard. Tom asked if his dad knew what the problem was with the water system. Stu laughed and replied with a lot of things. Then he went on to ask Tom if he noticed that the water out here tasted off. Tom only laughed at the question, but Stu went on to tell him that Lena's house, like many others around here, dumps some of its grey or brown water into the ground. No real problem there, except the houses also pulled the water from the ground, from below the level that the grey and brown water emptied to. It took Tom almost no time to figure out the problem. The garbage water was pouring on top of the drinking water. He laughed and said, well, that would make it taste off, which caused both of them to burst out laughing. It didn't take long for the two of them to figure out what the problem was. The intake from the water pump was clogged and gummed up. Neither of them were sure what the substance was, but it smelled bad. Tom simply called it brown stuff. Once they got the pump running, Stu left Tom to tidy up so that he could check on Henry. It looked like, best they could tell from looking through the window in the house, that Henry and Lena were playing a game at the kitchen table. With Stu gone to rescue Henry, Tom put the tools they used away, and was about to lock the wooden building back up when he noticed another sticky note next to the handle on the inside of the building. It had another number written on it, 196418. It looked to be written in the same handwriting as the other. Tom wondered why there would be one here and one in the house. He'd have to ask Lena. As he locked the door and finished up, Tom checked his watch. He wondered how long they were going to stay. It felt like they had been there over an hour between chatting, cookies, and fixing water. But as Tom stared at the hands on his watch, 
and did the mental math, he was surprised at how much time had actually passed. It had only been 10 minutes? That seemed impossible. That was like two or three songs. No way it had only been that long. As Tom returned to the house, Henry rushed out to greet him, with multiple cookies for each of them in his hands. Henry joked that he was pretty sure that their grandma had forced so many cookies on them so that they wouldn't put their masks back on. He told Tom how she was going on and on about the virus being a hoax by the gay liberal media to turn them all into socialists, which caused both of the boys to burst out laughing, and Henry to comment on how nice that sounded, to which Tom asked if Henry was okay. Henry had come out to Tom a few years earlier. Grandma Lena was last on the list of people he wanted to tell. Henry told Tom he was fine, which led to Tom giving him a hug. Tom thought about the sticky notes and the numbers on them. Then, as if he was reading Tom's mind, Henry asked if he noticed any strange numbers written down anywhere. Cookies in hand, the two boys started a slow walk around the property. Tom told him he'd found two sticky notes with numbers on them. Henry told him that he'd found a room full of printed off conspiracy theory papers taped to the walls, and there were numbers on sticky notes everywhere. Neither boy could remember any of the numbers. To them, they seemed random. Both boys, as if they were running on the same brainwave, tried to bring up what their dad had told them a few months ago. He'd mentioned the conspiracy theory stuff to the boys after a particularly challenging phone call with Lena. He'd recounted to them that he'd found it ironic that his parents told them not to believe everything they read online when he was younger. And now Lena seemed to be reciting hurtful, hateful conspiracy theories as if they were the gospel. As the two boys reached the edge of the property, almost all the way back to the road, the ground below their feet started to sway. It felt like something below the dirt was moving. They glanced back to see the house, which from here seemed to be up on a hill, wobbled. It lasted only a second. Neither boy was sure what it was. But as they stood back looking at the house, it almost looked like something massive was buried under it. A line ran around the property in a circle. The house and everything in the circle was about a foot taller than where they stood. They both asked each other if it was like that before. Neither was sure. As they started back to ask Stu about it, they noticed multiple large holes dotted the ground. They were certain those weren't there before. The holes stopped when they reached the raised circle that encompassed the house. At the edge of the circle, they cautiously stepped over and up onto the raised circle. Tom wasn't sure if it was in his head, but the dirt felt different, softer, like it had been loosened. The whole way back to the house, the boys couldn't stop talking about the holes, the ground shaking, the sticky notes, all of it. There was something strange going on at their grandma's house, they were sure of it. So much so that they reached the house and discovered a hole neither of them had seen before, descending down below the house. Neither of them had an objection to climbing down into it. I've been told to add a disclaimer here by the Aurora Wasteland. Don't climb down into holes. The outcome is always bad. When I asked for clarification on the whole bad thing, they simply replied, it would be bad. So there you have it. Don't climb down holes because it would be bad. Only for Tom and Henry, it wasn't bad. It was disappointing for one, confusing for the other. The tunnel ended at the edge of the house. There was, in fact, nothing exciting buried under Grandma's house, though Tom did discover another sticky note with another number on it, 121393. Henry, on the other hand, admitted to Tom he heard slow, depressing sounds like air or gas escaping something. Tom believed his brother like he always did, but confided in his brother that he didn't hear anything. The two boys climbed out of the hole, cleaned themselves up, and compared notes about the whole thing. They returned to Lena and their dad Stu. Again, Tom checked his watch. Again, he was certain they'd been there for hours. But like before, time hadn't moved as fast as it had felt. Based on his watch, it had only been five minutes since he'd last checked it. Fifteen total. That wasn't possible. He assumed his watch was broken and compared it to the clock in the car as they climbed in. To his confusion, his watch matched the car's clock. As Lena scolded Stu about how they don't come out there enough and that they never stay long enough, Henry and Tom continued to talk in the back seat. Tom thought they were stuck in some sort of Groundhog's Day time thing. Henry told him that he was wrong on so many levels and that obviously this was alien related. The lost time, the magnetism, the vents. He was pretty sure there was a UFO under Grandma's house. As Stu pulled the car away from the house and set off down the drive, Tom told his dad that Henry thought there was a UFO under the house. Stu shrugged and replied, there could be. He then asked the boys if they saw any of those sticky notes. He saw two of them, but couldn't remember the numbers either. Again, they joked that Stu must be adopted, and that they were partly sure Lena had murdered Stu's dad and buried him under the house. The laughter built as the car reached the end of the driveway, and Tom looked out the window. 
He was ready to go. The place felt strange. He couldn't put his finger on it. The whole place just felt off. He reached into his backpack that sat at his feet and pulled out his CD player. Despite what his watch told him, he was in dire need of some music because it had been way too long. He popped a new CD in, slipped his headphones on, and leaned back to enjoy the ride home, only to be startled by a bang on his window. Frantically, Lena knocked on his window. She was panting and out of breath. Stu rolled down Tom's window, and Lena handed them a plate of cookies. She said she was never going to eat them all. Then she asked what they were all laughing about. Henry leaned across Tom to take his cookies and jokingly told her that they were certain that there was a UFO buried under her house. They all waited for Lena to laugh, but she didn't. Instead, she told them that there had been one, a UFO that is, buried deep under her house, lower than the poo field, but that just last month, the Libs came to look at it when they turned her husband, Stu's father and Tom's grandfather, gay. They had suspected as much for years, but that Lena thought that the Liberals showed up to her house and somehow removed a UFO without disrupting her house or anything on top of it. They awkwardly said goodbye and set off on their journey home, being sure to ditch their plates of cookies as soon as they were far enough away from Lena's place. Tom drifted on his thoughts as the music from his CD player washed over him. He stared at the clouds and wondered if his grandfather really was just in town or if he had left Lena. Maybe doing so had broken her brain somehow, and that her thoughts about the UFO and the government were, were just her way of coping with it. With Henry drooling and asleep next to him, Tom glanced back in the direction of his grandma's house, and for the briefest of seconds, he might have seen a UFO in the sky, only to have it break apart and drift just like every other cloud. Newspaper Headlines Rise in Conspiracy Theories Linked to Social Isolation Edmonton Epoch Time doesn't work the way you think it does. Brightness Falls Gateway Increased streaming of X-Files has led to an increase in UFO sightings. E. Calgary Science Digest He's just gone to town. Tom's grandmother's newsletter Self-isolated rural residents at higher risk of poor quality cookies. Leftbridge Dark Times conclusion from the narrator. That's it. Who would have known that the generation who saw misinformation coming would not see it coming? And that given the time and solitude granted to them by the virus, that they'd be the first, but certainly not the last, to die face first into the shit pile of misinformation. Tom and Henry found nothing at their grandmother's farm. No UFOs, no aliens, nothing. Where their grandmother found everything, even if it equaled nothing. Life during the virus threw everyone off and had us questioning everything, which can be good, but sources matter. Your grandmother's newsfeed doesn't qualify as a vetted source. I really do wish there was something buried under Tom's grandmother's house, but like so many Aurora Wasteland cases, not everything is actually strange and weird. Sometimes, it's just life. Hey, my name is Von Ashby. I wrote this. If you liked what you heard, head on over to vonashby.com slash free and pick up a free novel or a bunch of other free stuff. Go explore the Aurora Wasteland yourself at aurorawasteland.com. Don't forget to check out the Stories from the Wasteland podcast and search for Von Ashby on YouTube for video versions and other exciting videos. Thanks for listening.